Good evening ladies and gentlemen, in this video our Minecraft clone is finally going to resemble something similar to, well, Minecraft. Essentially we're going to make it so that we can see loads of blocks at the same time. But before that, a user by the name of Drakir notified me of a problem that some of you may have encountered. The gist of it is that some hardware doesn't support 24-bit depth buffers, and that's the size Pyglet uses by default. To fix that, we just need to specify our depth buffer size to be 16 bits, which should be supported by all computers. So now that that's out of the way, I'd like to compare different methods of drawing all these blocks. So I'm going to set my update interval to something insanely small and print out the current frame rate in the update function just like this. The most naive way of drawing plenty of blocks is probably to translate and draw each one of them individually to the right position. But you'll quickly realize that this is, in fact, absurdly inefficient and agonizingly slow. Here I'm drawing only 16 by 16 by 16 blocks, or just over 4,000 blocks total, and I'm barely hitting a single glorious frame per second. A way better solution is to draw many, many blocks all in one go by grouping them into chunks. The general idea is to generate a mesh for the whole chunk based on the blocks in it instead of one for each block. To do this, it will be necessary to refactor our code quite a bit. I'm going to start by creating a chunk.py file, importing the usual, and creating three variables for the width, height, and length of each chunk in blocks. We'll see what impact different chunk sizes will have, but for now I'm going to leave it at 16 by 16 by 16 to compare with the previous example. So now the init function will take a chunk position argument and create a bunch of variables for holding the mesh data, and then create our VAO, all our VBOs, and our IBO just like we did for the single block. Then we create an update mesh function which will temporarily take a block type to add, and that starts off by setting all our variables correctly and then goes through every block position and adds it to our chunk mesh. Just keep in mind that we need to add the block's relative position as well as the chunk's position to the vertex positions before adding them to our chunk mesh. We also need to add the mesh index counter to each index of our block so that multiple blocks don't share the same vertices. Last thing to do in this function is to pass all the mesh data to the GPU, just like we did all the way back in episode 2. Also, make sure we actually have anything in our mesh before uselessly sending data to the GPU. Finally, we need to create the all-important draw function, which simply checks our mesh contains something to draw, finds our chunks VAO, and calls GL draw elements exactly like we're already doing with the block in our main draw function. Now we can say our valedictions to this code in main.py that has been with us through thick and thin. Why is that Google's first suggestion? Huh, interesting. Create a chunk dictionary with a chunk at a chunk position of 000, whose mesh we obviously have to update, and draw each chunk in that dictionary. And lo and behold, we're now reaching well over 3000 FPS for the exact same scene. That's about uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, 3,000 times better than when we were rendering each block individually. To make all this a bit more flexible, I'm going to create a world.py file which will handle all the chunks and also the different block types and textures. So similar to what we did in episode 5 in main.py, I'm going to create a texture manager and a block types array so that we can reference any block by a single number. The first block type, none, is going to represent air. Now we need a way to store blocks in our chunks, so I'm going to go ahead and add a world argument to our chunk classes init function and a three dimensional array for keeping all the block numbers, which I'll fill with the block number for air by default. Then we can create a dictionary to hold all our chunks, in which we can create a chunk, just like before. I'm going to fill this chunk entirely with cobblestone, like our previous example. Before we move on to creating our draw function though, we have to update the chunk's update mesh function by removing its block type argument and replacing it by getting the block number, checking if it's air or not, and then the block type at each local position in our chunk. And now we simply update our chunk's mesh, create our world's draw function, clean up main.py, create the world object, draw it, and you should see absolutely nothing change. Now you'll probably have realized by now that there are a lot of invisible block faces that are still being added to our list. To mend this, we need a function to get the block number at any position in the world, so that each block can check if adjacent blocks are hiding its faces. I'm gonna do this by first separating its components, dividing by the chunk size, and then flooring them to get the chunk position. Now that that's all done, we can check if a chunk at that place exists in our chunk dictionary, and if not, we want to simply pretend that there's air there instead. You'll see when we move on to infinite terrain generation that this isn't exactly perfect, but it'll do for now. Finally, if there is a chunk at that position, we can take the modulo by the chunk size of the components to get the relative position within the chunk and return the block in the relevant chunk at that local position. Okay, now we need to go into numbers.py to separate all the vertex positions, texture coordinates, and shading values by face to make our lives a little bit easier. We can get rid of the indices list completely because they're now going to be the same for each face, just offset by the mesh index counter. Then we need to tweak our block type.py file to reflect what we just changed. Now we just create a function for adding a face in our update mesh function which will be pretty similar to what we're doing for the whole block model, just that we need to index the right face in the block type's vertex position, texture coordinates, and shading values. Also, we need to create a new list for our indices and change these numbers a little bit. Finally, we just need to check for each face if there's a block adjacent with our world's get block number function and add the correct face if not. As you can see, all the faces inside our chunk that were previously hidden but still visible are now invisible, just like they should be. For now, the frame rate doesn't seem that different to when we were rendering everything, but for larger amounts of blocks, the difference definitely is going to be noticeable. 
In this best case scenario, with a chunk size of 128 and over 2 million blocks, our memory usage is about 1% of what it used to be, and our frame rate is nearly 50 times higher. Now there are much better ways to do this, and this is frankly a pretty slow way of doing it, but for simplicity's sake, I'm going to leave it at that. Anyway, it only affects loading times, not frame rates, not a big deal. One last thing we can do to speed things up a tad is to enable back face culling. To do this, we simply need to tell OpenGL to enable it, and flip these components around in numbers.py, since back face culling relies on the clockwiseness of our vertices to determine which face is front and which one is back. You can now see that the faces on the inside of our chunk are invisible. This more than doubles my frame rate in the best case scenario, but usually the difference will be fairly small. Now that we've got a solid chunk system, I'm going to quickly create some super basic terrain generation so we have something more interesting to look at. I'm going to try and replicate the first cave game tech test from Notch as seen in this video. Before I run this though, I'd like to point out that there seems to be a bug in Piglet that makes the terrain flicker that you can kind of fix by putting a GL finish call at the end of your draw call here. Anyways, as you can see, this all looks pretty nice. Last thing I'd like to touch on before ending the video is the significance of different chunk sizes. On one hand, the more things you draw at the same time and thus the bigger your chunks, the less chunks you'll have to draw total, which makes average FPS better, but updating chunks and regenerating their mesh is much slower since, well, they're bigger. On the other hand, the less things you draw at the same time and the smaller your chunks, the more chunks you'll have to draw total, which makes average FPS worse, but updating chunks and regenerating their meshes much faster since they're smaller chunks. So there really is a sweet spot to find. If your game is going to be more slow paced and adventure focused, you'll want larger chunks. But if your game is going to be fast paced and have a lot of environmental interaction, you'll want smaller chunks. Okay, that's just about it. Bye.